for the fourth and last session of the Corpus Curiosum Lecture Series. Um, just a few quick notes before we start. Um, first, the introduction and the main talk of each session uh, will be recorded and may be published. This may, may, may not be the case for this particular session. Um, however, your personal video as well as discussion at the end will neither be recorded nor published. Um, second, the Q&A session, we kindly ask you to send your questions at any point during the talk by the Zoom chat. And uh, you, can, you can use the group chat and please set everyone as a recipient and our guest speaker will answer your questions after the talk. Lastly, we aim to end latest around 4.30 p.m. UK time, depending on where you are situated. And moving on, yeah, as some of you, some of you might know, uh, the name Corpus Curiosum is derived from the Corpus Callosum, a tough nerve tract with hundreds of millions of external projections that connects the two brain hemispheres. And just like the Corpus Callosum, we as Corpus Curiosum want to connect different fields within and beyond neuroscience to communicate, debate, and engage. So this lecture series is specifically designed to expose early career researchers to new aspects of neuroscience and to promote cr critical thinking. About us, we are four early career researchers, um, ranging from postgraduate to postdoctoral positions based in London, Madrid, and Barcelona. And the diversity of us as, as researchers in both position, location, and interests reflects the diversity we aim to see in you, our, our target audience. And we are more than glad that we are on a fantastic way to reach this goal, actually, because uh, you, the audience, come from 33 countries across continents, from Australia to Peru, Peru, Malaysia, and we're really glad that we are reaching you. Um, and beyond that, um, you are affiliated with over 75 different institutions and companies worldwide. And um, seeing this diversity is fantastic, and our aim is to improve this even further. Finally, to the most interesting part um, of um, today's session, our guests for today. Um, so first of all, we have our speaker, uh, Laura Kettner, who is joining us. Um, she studies psychology at the Julius Maximilians University in Würzburg. She completed her master's project as an intern at the Center for Psychedelic Research, Imperial College London, where she, has investi where she investigated the subjective effects of psychedelic microdosing. She currently continues her studies there as a research assistant and is involved in the organization and development of an upcoming microdosing study aiming to identify efficacy, risks, and benefits of microdosing. Dr. David Arizzo, who will be joining us for the Q&A session, holds a NIHR academic clinical lectureship in psychiatry at Imperial College London. Alongside his clinical work in medicine and psychiatry, uh, David conducts psychopharmacological research using brain imaging techniques such as PET and MRI. He was trained in PET imaging at Columbia University in New York and later undertook a PhD at University Hospital uh, Rist Hospital in Copenhagen. Since 2009, he has been involved in postdoc imaging research uh, in the neurobiology of addictions and major depression at Imperial College London, and together with Professor David Ness and Dr. Robin Card Harris, he investigates mechanisms and therapeutic potential of MDMA and classic psychedelics. So for today's talk, um, we're talking about research on drugs um, and early career um, experience. And we will, uh, Laura will provide a short overview of attempts to study this phenomenon, um, specifically aimed on uh, her research on microdosing. And yeah, the floor is yours, Laura. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, cool. Thank you for the introduction. Um... So I'm Laura. Um, today, today I will talk about uh, my experience with uh, trying to study microdosing. And currently I'm working as a research assistant at the Center of Psychedelic Research. Um, I started my position recently and uh, will talk about what I've encountered so far. Um, so at the Center for Psychedelic Research, we uh, investigate the brain effects of psychedelics and their potential clinical application as a treatment for um, psychopathologies with a major focus um, currently at depression, but we have a few more um, upcoming trials. And generally, I'm just saying I will not talk uh, much about drug laws and prohibition because it's simply not my expertise. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a politician, but it's just about like giving you an overview of like how my work so far looked like. Um, okay, 
So here you can see uh, a timeline of psychedelic publications, um, the proportion of total PubMed publication on psychedelics. And as you can see, um, psychedelic studies in general, they went, underwent a significant expansion following, following the discovery of LSD in 1943. Um, so there was like the so-called first wave of psychedelic science. And classic psychedelics such as psilocybin or LSD, they were uh, extensively studied back then as far as possible and used in psychiatry. And um, then in 1967, they were placed in the Schedule 1 of the UN Convention of Drugs and classified as Class A drugs in the UK by the Misuse of Drugs Act in 1971. And um, this basically laid, led to like a subsequent hiatus in psychedelic research. And before that, psychedelics were a powerful research tool. Um, <clears throat> so what Schedule 1 means basically is that these substances are defined as drugs with no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. And um, psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, for example, are Schedule 1 drugs and are severely restricted. And um, this means also that all use is uh, prohibited except for scientific and very limited medical purposes, but only by authorized uh, persons and um, also only by established medical or scientific uh, institutions which are under the direct control of um, the government. And then we need like a certain approval that we can take out this research. Um, so this research can only be taken out if you have this approval. So the um, governmental institution here in the UK, the Home Office, can provide sites, um, meaning laboratories or hospitals, with a specific license that you can study these drugs. And um, without a license like this, uh, this can like bring severe penalties. We have such a um, Home Office license, um, so we can carry out this research. Um, and as you see in the curve, um, after this, uh, these new drug laws, um, the research slowly started to die out. That was due to, because it was hard to get funding. And if there was funding, the bureaucratic costs were so high that uh, institutions who wanted to study um, psychedelics ran out of money quite quickly. And um, since the beginning of the 2000s, like in 2006, um, there have been several pilot, pilot trials and randomized control trials using classic psychedelics um, and healthy volunteers and also in non-psychotic non -psychotic, psychotic disorders. And um, these so far have provided encouraging results and preliminary edit evidence for safety and efficacy. Um, however, there's still uh, a few legal hurdles um, in studying these drugs and also licensing them as a treatment uh, will still take some bureaucratic effort. Um, yeah, exactly. So next slide. Um, okay, what am I doing? What do I have to do with this? So I don't know if anyone of you heard of this phenomenon. Um, so in the past few years, uh, a concept called microdosing has gained considerable media attention and uh, several books have been published on this topic where the authors claim significant uh, value to this microdosing procedure and uh, that's how this concept was introduced to the public. Uh, however, there's currently just very few scientific uh, research and uh, no one really knows how it works, if it works and what it does um, and what it actually is. So there's no consensus on what microdosing really means. What is a microdose? So, and I can say it's a widely used concept, what, how it's common, commonly proposed. Um, it describes the regular ingestion of uh, sub-threshold sub or threshold, perceptual, threshold, threshold level perceptible doses of classic psychedelics. So people use like one tenth or one twentieth of uh, ordinary dose. And the most common motives are uh, for self-medication. So people want to treat um, physiological or psychological ailments or um, performance enhancement, like human enhancement approaches where people want to function better, enhance the productivity, creati creativity, and their workforce. Um, what is quite interesting is that all these anecdotal reports um, are very, very positive. So people claim that they experience um, significant improvements in their mood, uh, in their cognition, in their creativity, but uh, with like mostly low side effects and no really acute subjective drug effects. Um, 
and there's an increasing thirst for knowledge because many people are self-experimenting with microdosing and they also promote its effectiveness they they spread the information online um, but there's no really an evidence base that can say okay this is what it does and it really helps and th this other, these are the risks um, so there's an increasing thirst for knowledge and increasing cultural but also scientific and clinical and potentially clinical relevance but no scientific grounds what this is based on and here, for example, you can see this, these are, um, this is an excerpt of a paper from Anderson. And you can see a graph showing the increase in sub sub subscription rates um, to the online forum Reddit, with the subreddit on microdosing. And this, this is like just an example for a fora where um, people meet and exchange their experiences and provide information on common microdosing protocols and just spread, spread the message around. Um, <clears throat> so as I already said, um, the, the growing popularity and the media visibility was brought into prominence uh, by books that were published on the topic, um, with Fadiman publishing a book in 2011 uh, called Psych Like Explorer's Guide, and this was followed by like multiple internet community uh, fora where the message is just being spread across. Um, and I think like this in increased interest um, in microdosing emerged from a more general increase in scientific and medical research for psychedelics. Mm. And from such accounts, like people report, as I said already, many, many positive things. So increase in energy, well-being, cognition, concentration, creativity, all of these nice things, but also report, okay, I actually experienced reduced anxiety, reduced depression, addiction, pain relief. So maybe there is some clinical potential maybe it may work for some people the problem is right now we don't really know um but it's also a problem because it gains so much traction people are self-experimenting without medical supervision on their own behalf um and we just don't know anything about potential adverse effects about the potential beneficial effects um yeah, and as you can see, also the illegality of these substances may not necessarily hinder them from doing so, what is also quite interesting to see. Um, and there's also an interesting review paper from uh, Kim Kuipers, where they, the authors are discussing um, all the open questions that remain unanswered or microdosing and what future research needs to tackle on this matter. Um, if anyone is interested, give it a read. <clears throat> so, just in general, so far we have very little evidence on the effectiveness of, of this phenomenon. Um, the evidence that is there is uh, quite discrepant, so there are quite discrepant results. It's not a clear picture. Um, there have been a few observational uncontrolled studies um, that have mostly been carried out online, and those results are overall very positive. Um, but you have to keep in mind, these studies have um, method methodological limitations and you have to take the results with a grain of salt, of course. And placebo controlled studies, for example, there have only been a few, I think two, two of them, and they could not find compelling evidence for positive effects of microdosing on mood and cognition, but they could also not find any evidence for impairing effects. So it was kind of a net zero null effect. Um, so we will discuss shortly on like how you can carry out online service because that's what I've done as my master's project. Um, and generally the questions we're trying to answer is, okay, are there actually effects beyond placebo? Means that if microdoses are actually pharmacologically active and uh, if they can accompany beneficial effects on mood and cognition, um, if there are effects, are these effects solely positive or are, is, how is the risk benefit, risk benefit ratio, what's the side effect profile, are there substance specific effects, for example, if you compare psilocybin versus LSD, LSD has like much longer lasting pharmacokinetics, for example, how does that, yeah, in the end look like. And most importantly, what we would be interested in, um, may it have clinical relevance in whatever way that may look like. Um, I mean, it's very still far away, but this would be the end goal. That's why we're interested in the first place and looking at these things. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'll give you an overview about the evidence that is there so far. Um, so in the first wave of psychedelic research, you can see 
um, generally the, there was not much interest in microdosing because it was like not such a pushed concept. Um, but there was interest in measuring fatal doses of LSD because it's like a very, very potent substance. Um, and if you run your eyes to the table, you can see, okay, the threshold where you can measure subjective drug effects is around 25 milligrams. That would be kind of in an upper range of a microdose. Um, and here you can see a table with more modern, more recent research on microdosing. Looks like it's actually quite a bit, um, but it's not that much. Um, it's just an excerpt. There are a few more uh, publications on observational studies, but I thought that's enough to give you a quick overview. So in light green, you can see the, um, the observational uncontrolled studies. They're mostly web-based or um, carried out in a naturalistic, uncontrolled, open label setting. Um, or in light blue, you can see um, uh, the lab-based placebo-controlled studies. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in general, you don't have to read this table now. I can explain you what's, what's on there, uh, especially the less controlled observational um, studies that have been published so far um, have largely supported the positive anecdotes about microdosing um, and have like positive evidence on beneficial effects on mood, well-being, um, improvements in overall psychological functioning. But the problem of these studies is um, you can actually say, okay, this is a collection of subjective reports because you try to quantify uh, what people report so you can capture the experience online with questionnaires but um, it's still very subjective. We don't have a control group. Um, there is a large heterogeneity of substances and doses and dosing regimes used in general. People use black market substances. That also leads to many dose inaccuracies. So it's not that you really capture this one concept of microdosing. It's like you capture just many, many, yeah, much information on, in general. Um, and a few placebo controlled studies um, as you can see in blue um, yeah what they found was actually basically not much um, there was no compelling evidence for positive and negative effects on mood and cognition um, and overall the picture is very discrepant uh, in these results and there may be like there are a few reasons why that could be the case um, yeah i will not go into that in too much detail we can discuss it maybe in the q a um, but just to give a quick overview, so it could be that the results of the placebo controlled trials are not very generalizable, it's very low sample sizes, they use healthy volunteers, so maybe potential antidepressant or mood enhancing effects are not captured that well in a um, healthy population. Uh, it can also be that the observational studies are highly, highly biased um, and it's like a massive placebo effect that we're capturing and it doesn't really do anything in the end. Um, and that the effects of microdosing may, in general, be hard to measure as well. Um, okay, and generally, what is also interesting, what has been there on uh, as brain imaging data, um, there was a PET imaging study uh, conducted uh, investigating the relationship um, of serotonin, serotonin to a receptor occupancy, plasma levels like blood plasma levels of psilocybin and subjective drug effects. Um, and what has actually been found was uh, that the receptor occupancy was closely associated with the psychedelic experience, what is, of course, interesting. But more interesting for us in terms of microdosing is that a, like a three milligram dose of psilocybin had noticeable um, perceptual effects and uh, a receptor occupancy of 43%, for 43%, um, what is actually quite high. So this could speak to like some very preliminary preliminary evidence, okay, there may be some valid and legitimate psychopharmacological effects of microdosing, uh, maybe, eventually. So I have to say this was like in one subject, uh, three milligram dose, but still um, it gives a nice idea. Um, but also, of course, what I mentioned before, it's quite important to look at is um, yeah, the side, side effect profile, the risk benefit ratio of microdosing, is it only positive? And it's worth noting that um, uh, some people report negative experiences from microdosing. And there's been a survey carried out um, where 20% of the respondents, I think, uh, reported to have experienced negative psychological and also physiological effects. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it's just important to consider what are like potential like detriments and drawbacks of microdosing. 
Um, also interesting is like results of another observational studies. That's why I'm saying, okay, observational studies are interesting because they can inform us on so many things we could uh, investigate in the future. So it's not that this is all bullshit. Um, it gives us, of course, like important information on what we can look at in the future. Um, here, you, for example, can see it's another collection of uh, short descriptive reports of microdoses on their experience. Um, and this is important because it can be used for hypothesis generation. And microdoses here were prompted to provide up to three benefits and up to three challenges they were um, experiencing with microdosing. And the authors ident identified like more categories uh, on what microdosing may do. Sorry, that's me. Um, and what is interesting is there was a, like, a specific parallelism between um, these benefits and challenges and uh, between these categories. So people reported increased versus impaired focus. They, they reported improved in energy versus anxiety. They had improved mood versus impaired mood. Um, so yeah, you can say, okay, maybe these uh, results are kind of paralleling, paralleling each other out. Um, and every category could be seen as like a benefit and a challenge. Um, yeah, and this could be due to, again, many reasons, but what you can say, for example, is, okay, maybe it's just random noise. It doesn't have any effects. It's a net zero effect and effects are canceling each other out. Or you can say, okay, maybe microdosing does any, anything. And um, as compared to full dose uh, effects, it can increase your contact sensitivity and expectancy may play a role in the effects of microdosing so that you have an influence of set and setting even in microdosing and the effects depend on maybe the current mind state of a of a person on set and setting values um, or there are massive inter-individual differences in specific variables that may like determine how people experience microdosing um, <clears throat> so that's important to keep in mind um, Another thing to consider, okay, what's potential physiological side effects? Uh, um, for example, the repeated stimulation of 5 hd 2 b receptors could, be, ha could have cardiotoxic effects. In, in theory, is, these are things that would, have been, would need to be tested in, for example, preclinical um, studies like animal models. Um, <clears throat> Okay, this was like a lot of information. I give you an intermediate summary. <laughs> um, so, so far, basically, we don't know much. Um, there's only very prelim preliminary evidence on the effects of microdosing, and the evidence we have is uh, a bit contradictory. So there's not a clear picture. Um, the positive reports that um, are, are reported are like mostly anecdotal, mostly from the um, observational web-based studies, and the few placebo-controlled studies have not found very compelling evidence for positive or negative effects, I have to say. Um, and generally, you have to mention like without carefully designed randomized controlled trials, there's not really much evidence that microdosing has any beneficial effects. Um, <clears throat> Exactly, and I also uh, what I have to say, um, it's also important to think, okay, which of these claims are really reflecting the truth? Um, so things that can play in, in there are massive placebo effects, uh, it's very subjective, self-deceptive impressions, and why is it that highly promoted on the internet? Because there are a few people who may have financial interests and are kind of self-claimed microdosing experts and there is actually, there are a few people who give microdosing advice, um, do microdosing counseling and advise people on how to microdose and get money for that. It's a bit, I think, problematic. Um, so, okay, so far so good. What have I actually been doing? Um, so as my master's project, I've been carrying out uh, a microdosing survey, like another observational study, um, also web-based. Um, so that's how it looks like. Um, there's a website, um, you can go there and if you plan to microdose, you can sign up and say, hey, I want to microdose. And you get uh, many, many emails with many, many questionnaires over a longer time period. But um, an advantage of this one is that it's a more systematic observational um, but prospective investigation of people who microdose. So we track changes from uh, before to after and intermittent um, 
so it's not cross-sectional or retrospectively. This is a bit more powerful than if you just ask people, okay, you've been microdosing, how has it been? So we track them from before and after. Um, so what we did here, we investigated just the subjective psychological effects. So we didn't have any cognitive tasks. It's just questionnaire based. And our, we have like many outcomes in there that we were interested in, but the main outcome variables were well-being, depressive symptoms and anxiety, because we wanted to focus on um, the potential uh, mental health effects of microdosing. And of course, we wanted to identify further influential variables, um, but yeah. It has been much in there. I just report you that the most interesting results. Um, <clears throat> whoops. Um, so generally what you can say about the sample, of course, as you would expect, like 85% um, were psychedelic experience. So many, like most people had experience with psychedelics before, uh, only 15% were naive. Um, and some also had tried microdosing before. Uh, and also, what's interesting is that people mostly followed uh, a very commonly um how you say commonly not prescribed but uh, pushed protocol online where you say okay i want to dose every uh, fourth day um, i have a dose and i have two days in between um <clears throat> so it kind of reflects um the the information flood that's online on what's the best way to microdose um generally what's most interesting to see um is here the uh, main results over time. So we found significant increases in well-being. Uh, they were accompanied by significant decreases in anxiety and depressive symptoms. Um, but if you look at the mean scores, uh, remarkably, um, they were very, very low, like uh, below population norm, and the sample was mildly depressed if you only look at the mean scores. Um, so I, I looked a bit more deeply into the data and identified there's like a clinically relevant subsample um, where, yeah, people were mildly to moderately, sometimes severely depressed. So 40 of those who actually, like I had uh, 81 in total who completed the whole study, so I've had a massive dropout, I have to say. And for those time points, you can only look at those people who were completed every time point. So that's why the sample is so low. But if you look at it, I get like 40 classified um, by the self-report uh, questionnaire as depressed. And if you look at the graph, um, you can see the red, um, the red lines, the depressed people. Um, they have much more scope for change and they improve quite quickly. Whereas um, the effect for the uh, healthy population, sub-sample, sub, sub there was no significant change. So they didn't change much. Um, and you can ask yourself, okay, why do they not change? Maybe uh, it could be, yeah, it doesn't really do something for um, healthy people. Um, there's no, if there is like some antidepressant effect eventually, um, a healthy person may not experience it like this. And um, those who actually suffer from um, mild symptoms may benefit the most, either because they have more scope for change, um, that's the simple explanation, or because they have a different antidepressant effect. Um, that's a big question we don't know, but like that's why my study was a bit interesting to look at. Okay, what actually what is actually happening over time? Um, <clears throat> one second. Okay. Uh, yeah. Anyways, there was like much more data in there. I spare you on this. Um, uh, what's the main takeaway of this uh, small study? Um, yeah. Okay. We had changes. Um, everything nice and well but then we also looked okay does uh, do expectations at baseline predict uh, the outcome change and yeah to some deg degree they did um so um expectancy at baseline was associated with the outcome change at uh, four weeks afterwards and we cannot really say okay this these effects are due to microdosing um there's not nothing we cannot draw any meaningful conclusion so generally, we found all these nice uh, increases and decreases in the variables under investigation. And the results kind of seem to be supportive of some impact of microdosing, maybe. Um, but the limitations of the study design um, preclude, preclude us from making strong inferences about causal relations. And we can also not distinguish drugs from placebo effects, really. Um, <clears throat> so here, uh, you see like a hierarchy of scientific evidence. This is how you can um, kind of rank the re relative strength of, of your results um, obtained from your research based on your study design. And with the survey I did, I kind of 
here. It's not too bad, but it's also not too good. Um, but uh, we had some uh, other things also going on um, in the background. And that uh, kind of could reflect something like a placebo controlled um, trial. Um, but the magic about this was it was also carried out uh, online. Um, and yeah, that can save many, many costs, can save a lot of effort. It's also a lot of effort, but um, it's less costly, um, generally speaking. So we had another survey um, that was uh, designed by um, Dr. Balas Shishketi. I hope I'm saying his name right. Um, he's one of our collaborators. Um, and um, David has also been involved in the whole setup and organization of the study. And it's quite a brilliant uh, setup. Um, uh, so <clears throat> participants, um, we don't encourage like we don't encourage people on microdosing, but we tell them, okay, if you're planning to do it anyways, hold on, um, follow this weird procedure and blind um, yourself and on what you're actually taking. So it's a self-blinding study because people set up their own blinding procedure. They, um, yeah, I'll get to it in a second. Um, but anyways, with that we can kind of resemble like a randomized placebo controlled trial that people are carrying out at their homes and we can achieve much higher sample sizes than we when when we have to get them into the lab for example um so what people do they take um their uh, drug um plotters that they have cut up it's like micros and very very small and put them into uh, non-transparent gel capsules and create um, placebo capsules and um, actually active dosing capsules and then prepare that in a way that they don't know what they're taking and we kind of can track that back. Um, yeah, so this is the setup of the study basically. Uh, don't try to understand every detail of it, it's just like to give you a general overview. It's quite complicated, um, I understand like let's say half of it. Um, <clears throat> But anyways, uh, if you want to really microdose, there's like a detailed manual online. People can follow that through, can um, blind themselves. Um, and there's also like, as I showed before, there's a video online that one of the participants actually made. Um, super helpful to uh, explain the whole procedure. And there's like a standard custom schedule in the manual or people can arrange it however they want to. Um, they just have to gather all the materials and basically set the study up themselves. Um, yeah, it involves many details, but how it actually looks like in the end is that we um, have also, it's a pr prospective online um, study, and um, so we track people over time. We have baseline measures before they start, then we have uh, weekly measures um, and measures in the week itself again during the microdose. Now we have like long term follow up measures. And in this study, uh, we looked at cognitive uh, performance as well. So there were cognitive tasks included uh, next to subjective um, self report questionnaires. But this is, of course, much more pow powerful. And the study um, in total takes two weeks, uh, and people are microdosing for four weeks in total. Um, so, super interesting, uh, very brilliant study. Um, I was helping out uh, with uh, a bit like working on the analysis on the results. Um, yeah, that was a cool experience to be honest. So anyways, um, so what is the pros and cons of this approach? Um, the cons is okay, again, we don't have a control over, drug, over the drug, over the quantity of the quality of the drug, and people could cheat, of course. But also this is like a brilliant idea because it has a placebo control. We have control group. Control group. Uh, the costs are minimal, and uh, we have a poten potential for a, like large sample size. What would be so costly if you do it in the lab? Um, and if we look, if the blinding procedure worked, um, it seemed to be the case. Um, exactly. And uh, in general, we. One second. Um, reached like a high number of people. So as you can see, many, many people signed up. It's like 1,600. Um, many also did not start, but uh, a lot of states in the study. For example, I had 250 signups, similar as here, but in the end I had 
80 who completed the whole study. So I had a massive dropout and you don't know why people are dropping out. That's a problem. Um, because it could be that it doesn't work or it could also be that people just don't want to fill out all these annoying questionnaires all the time. Um, so it's kind of a biased data set. But here of the 200, approximately 250 who started, we had um, like, a, I think the dropout was minimal. Um, that I can't see on the graph who completed it, but it was like, I think 204. Um, so many people stayed in the study and the randomization procedure worked. Um, the blinding procedure seemed to work. So all went well. Um, what was interesting and kind of also a bit surprising for us because we, we thought we would see something. Um, generally, please don't take any pictures or screenshots of these uh, graphs because it's pre-publication. -pre um, just saying. Um, but the results just were generally, yeah, no results. We didn't find uh, any improvements in the microdosing group that we didn't find in the other groups. I forgot to say there were three groups, like one microdosing group, one placebo group, and one uh, group that was half-half. So they had like one week microdosing, one week placebo, kind of intermixed um, in their scheme. So yeah, anyways, interestingly, all the improvements that we found were there in the other groups too. So there were changes over time, but they were also in all the other groups. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what else is important? Oh yeah, uh, we also had evidence for some acute effects. So we found uh, reductions in uh, anxiety and increased positive mood, but um, under the influence of a microdose, but this effect was more stronger when people actually guessed to have been on a microdose than um, when they actually have been on a microdose. Um, overall, statistical analysis is very hard to explain in this case because it has been quite a tricky um, way to analyze, but this is the main message you can take away. So as you can see in the graph, um, the guess actually says much more of like the, the outcome we measured in the end than the actual condition that they were in. What is super interesting. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we have been doing online. And um, of course, then the questions arise, okay, what do we do with this now? Why do we not find anything? What does it mean? And there's still many, many open questions. Um, first of all, um, we still don't know, are there any effects beyond placebo? Because there is evidence, there may be some effects, um, but we still don't know. And um, could there be any clinically relevant effects? How can we maybe improve the study design and how can we possi possibly measure um, effects if they are there? So, um, yeah, then the idea was of David um, that we could maybe get people into the lab um, before and after they might and have like more hands-on measure and um, at uh, lab visit to the online version of the study. And uh, he managed to actually get NIHR funding. And um, now we have uh, a year, we had a year to carry out the study. So what we wanted to do is um, at lab visits before micro people start microdosing and after um, they finished microdosing. And the goal was that we have people in, invited who are, of course, like a kind of local, so a subset of greater London area-based participants should be invited. Um, and we wanted to add neurophysiological measures, um, extra relevant cognitive behavioral paradigms um, that we could not access, like assess online, like more hands-on measures. And um, <clears throat> additionally to that, epigenetic testing, um, drug testing, so we want to test their drugs to see what are people actually taking. So we wanted to do not only qualitative testing, also quantitative. So really see, okay, how much is in like a microdose? Like what are people usually taking? Because um, it's the best approach. We could like actually get hands on this data. Um, but this is where we actually ran into problems at the moment. And um, yeah, because if we have some bureaucratic hurdles to do this, um, <clears throat> what of course makes the study like less interesting if we don't really know what they're taking because this is especially important to see okay if there are black market substances is it really the drug that people think they're taking or is it something else could this have any dangerous effects uh, long-termly um, 
so we have a harm reduction argument and like of course um, a sci scientific argument why this is important to do and yeah this is what i'm currently working on to try to get through um i think yeah that's all i have to say about my research research experience with microdosing uh, of course i want to thank everyone involved um and uh, especially Dr. Balashishgeti, um, David, who is my supervisor, boss, uh, mentor, everything. Um, yeah, and that's it from my side. <laughs>